I'm Bruce Fumi and this is Scotland History Tours. Now, I've had a couple of people in the comment section say, you're always talking about Scots in America. Why can't you do something about Scots in Australia? And to be honest, there's a man that I'd intended to cover from the time that I started making these videos. It's just that it's taken till now, because for his story, I have to take you on a boat trip. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Whenever you approach the ferry port of Craig Newer on the Isle of Mull, you see a castle on the shore. That's Duart Castle, the seat of the Maclean's. Now, the mother of today's character grew up there, so let's be honest, he's a bit posh. I mean, Highland posh, but still posh. Our own hero didn't grow up there. In fact, he didn't even grow up in the Isle of Mull. He grew up on an even smaller island off the coast of Mull, but he headed off and joined the army when he was 14. Before he was 16, he was off to fight rebellious colonists in the Americas who were up to no good. And by the time he'd finished stints there, in the West Indies, Egypt and India, it was 1807. He was commander of the 73rd Foot, and he was on his second marriage after his first wife died of TB. He then took a much longer boat journey than us, to Australia. Now, let's be clear. When our hero went to Australia, it wasn't Australia. It was a British penal colony in the arse end of the world, all of which at the time was called New South Wales. The fact that we call it Australia today is largely because of our hero. Let me give you a very brief potted history of New South Wales until our hero arrives. And I'm not going to mention lots of names apart from two because I think you'll find them interesting. In 1788, a small fleet of ships arrived in Botany Bay. They contained people convicted of crimes of the day, a specially recruited regiment of marines to keep order, officials and some free folk to set up this new penal colony. They came ashore at Sydney Cove on the 26th of January. They cleared a camp, raised a flag and made toast to the King and Queen. Australians now celebrate this as Australia Day. Although, if you were one of the people who were already living there, you'd justifiably take a dramatically different view, but that is a much bigger debate. Now, the regiment of marines that I mentioned were enlisted for three years. Over those three years, the colony was started, managed by the governor and supervised by the marines. In 1791, a new cohort of troops arrived to be stationed on a more permanent basis. The New South Wales Corps were led by the new governor and our first named character, Francis Gross. Gross overturned the work and the civil structures of the outgoing governor, establishing the military as the legal and administrative authority, abandoning the principle of equal rations for all in favour of military officers and awarded land grants to officers of the Corps. When you look at kleptocratic military juntas like Myanmar, remember, they're probably not as far from you in time and space as you think. Gross also relaxed restrictions on rum trading. More than anything else, this corrupt military enterprise was based on rum. With no currency, rum brought in from India became the medium of exchange. Military officers used their positions to control and profit from it. So much so that the New South Wales Corps became known as the Rum Corps. And the reason I mentioned Francis Gross by name is because at the same time as he was engaged in his activities on behalf of the British state, his dad, also called Francis Gross, was in Scotland writing a book called The Antiquities of Scotland. In return for a page in the book featuring the old churchyard at Alloway, he persuaded Robert Burns to write a ghost story that I'm sure you'll have heard of or even be able to recite. Tam Shanta. Funny, in Sydney there's a statue of Robert Burns, but there's not one of Francis Gross. Gross returned to the UK in 1795, but the foundations had been set. 
Successive governors tried various tactics, but they all struggled to deal with drunkenness, the use of rum as the de facto currency, or the stranglehold, corruption and indiscipline of the rum corps. Here's where I give you the second name you might recognise, Captain William Bly. You'll know him from the mutiny on the bounty, where his harsh and overbearing demeanour led to mutiny and him being set adrift on an open boat at sea. Well, that went so well that in 1805 they thought, he's the very man to sort out New South Wales, on twice the wages of the previous government. Bottom line is, it led to an uprising and a takeover that we now call the Rum Rebellion. Captain Bly was again put on a boat, but this time kept as a prisoner. Quite a CV he was working up. And that was where Captain Bly remained until our hero, Lachlan Macquarie, born across there in Ulva, arrived as governor with a 73rd Regiment of Foot on the last day of 1809. Now, if it seems like this story's been largely about other people, I apologise. But without the context, you wouldn't realise quite the impact that Macquarie made. Look, another way to measure his impact is the fact that he was promoted from Lieutenant Colonel to Colonel a year later, and then Brigadier the year after that, and Major General two years after that. Basically, every time a letter came from Britain, he got a promotion. He immediately overturned the changes brought about by the Rum Rebellion conspirators. Then he set to longer lasting work. Now, don't forget, the reason for the Rum Rebellion was essentially that military gangsters didn't like government getting in the way of business. Macquarie returned New South Wales to civil courts. He bought 40,000 Spanish dollar coins and got a forger to cut holes out the middle and stamp them. That way, each dollar produced two coins, which were only of value in the colony, and they now had two units of New South Wales's first official currency. Modernly, Sydney is based on the street plan that he laid out. I'm told that the poshest bit of Sydney is called Macquarie Street. He designed the local hospital at the time. He also had a government building and a conservatoire of music built against the wishes of the British government. You see, while the British government saw a dumping ground for convicts, Macquarie saw the potential for a new nation. Of course, he still had trouble with vested interests. Not only had he interfered with the profits from rum trade, but there was pushback from those in control of the local court. But there was an even bigger scandal to come. You see, there were two types of citizens in New South Wales. Exclusives and emancipists. The exclusives were the free people who arrived of their own accord. The emancipists were the convicts who'd been released or pardoned after their sentence. Needless to say, when Macquarie started to allow civic rights and participation to the emancipists, the exclusives didn't enjoy quite the same level of exclusivity. That put the koala bears amongst the dingoes, didn't it? But it was worse than that. You see, he had emancipists round for tea at Government House. <gasps> he appointed one as a magistrate. No! And he encouraged them to get involved in the church. Oh, call the vicar Mrs Oakshot's fainted! Now these liberal policies implemented by the man who was now its longest serving governor were what started the transformation from New South Wales penal colony to Australian nation. And you'll see rivers, lakes, islands, passes, streets and towns all over the country named after him. The mausoleum where he and his family rest here in Mull is maintained by the National Trust of Australia for the man that they call the father of Australia. Of course, there were two groups who might not have viewed Lachlan Macquarie quite so favourably. The exclusives complained to London about his authoritarianism, which ultimately led to his resignation and a New South Wales Legislative Council being put into place. If you were an emancipist who'd levelled up, he was a hero. If you were an exclusive who no longer had privilege and people to look down on, then, not so much. 
Now, in truth, both groups had somebody to look down on. Let's not forget that the locals, the indigenous people, the people who were displaced by convicts and marines, then rum corps and then gold rushers, and of course, in the 1960s, my parents-in-law's is £10 poms. Lachlan Macquarie initiated some brutal actions against those indigenous people. Now, he's the hero of today's video, but no hero is without flaw. Often people comment that, oh, you can't judge people in history by the standards of our day. And I get that. Although often it's said by people who cling on to superior and callous attitudes of yesteryear. If we can't judge kleptocratic military juntas because it's the way things were back then, does that mean that we can't judge them in places where they're the norm today? If autocratic government, violence and ethnic cleansing were the norm back then, does that mean that we accept them where they're the norm today? Now, I came to praise Caesar, not to bury him. Every one of us is a complex mixture of light and shade, capable of great achievements and also capable of compassion, condescension or contempt. Policies implemented by Lachlan Macquarie were seen as progressive and liberal in their day. If somebody else had gone to New South Wales, what would life have been like for the emancipists then? What would Australia be today? Would the folks who belonged there for centuries have fared better or worse? I have no idea. I'm not saying that we should judge Lachlan Macquarie by the standards of our time. I'm saying that we should judge ourselves by those standards. To find out about the life of a pioneer of another nation formed out of a British colony, why not watch my video on John Witherspoon here? In the meantime, Hamian Dawkins can be Lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.